It is now time for our oral questions. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question um, to the Premier. Uh, Premier, yesterday your Minister of Finance said that Ontario was the lowest cost and lowest tax jurisdiction in North America. Um, I, I think you know that's not even close to being true. Your lead on the gas plant committee compared the abuse of the gas plants to a rocket shot to the moon uh, in terms of being a worthwhile investment. And you yourself, um, headline of the Toronto Star April 3rd, said that the death of Ontario's manufacturing sector is a myth. Um, Premier, I don't know if this simply reflects that your government's become out of touch, uh, increasingly arrogant, whatever you want to call it. I ask you, how do those types of attitudes attract a single job to the province of Ontario? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I believe that talking up Ontario and making sure, making sure that people understand that this is a place that business can thrive, Mr. Speaker. The, the, comment, uh, the comment about manufacturing, Mr. Speaker, arose out of the 10 jobs roundtables that I did around the province with, uh, with some of my, the ministers in the cabinet, Mr. Speaker, where we talked to people who are in manufacturing, who are hiring folks, who are talking to us about how we can invest in innovation to, uh, in fact, grow the manufacturing sector, Mr. Speaker, and how important it is that we not lose sight of the fact that Ontario is an important manufacturing uh, centre, Mr. Speaker. So that's where that comment came from. That talking up Ontario, making sure we understand that we can draw, we can draw industry and investment yes, to the province, Mr. Speaker, rather than denigrate, denigrating the province, Mr. Speaker, which makes Thank no sense to me at all. Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Speaker. I mean, respectfully, Premier, it's not talk that's going to get Ontario moving forward. It's making the right decisions to grow our economy, to rein in spending, to take Ontario down a very different path. I, um, but I do want to focus particularly on the play in the manufacturing sector. We've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs under the uh, mcguinty win Liberal government. Sadly, A. O. Smith in Fergus uh, got the news recently there, closing down, moving to Tennessee and 350 jobs. My colleague from Wellington Halton Hills, Ted Arnett, has been a champion for the manufacturing sector. He went to the plant himself to try to fight for those jobs to keep them here in the province of Ontario. Ted's doing the right thing, but it really hurts his ability to attract jobs to this province when the Premier says Question. that the death of manufacturing in Ontario is a myth. Yeah. Premier, will you apologize for making those dramatically out of touch? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Sorry, I'm I spoke with uh, I spoke with folks in uh, in uh, that situation. I, uh, I had a conversation with the the member. Uh, I spoke with folks in Fergus and the A. L. Smith uh, plant, Mr. Speaker. And I know I know that that's a difficult and painful situation, Mr. Speaker. I understand that. But the reality is that if we are going to thrive as a province, we need to recognize that bringing bringing business to the province is is absolutely a possibility, and it's happening, Mr. Speaker. We have we have regained. 400,000 jobs since the downturn, Mr. Speaker. It's absolutely necessary. So making sure that we understand the conditions, making, uh, making sure we understand what the infrastructure is that's needed, Mr. Speaker, so that we can create those conditions so that business will come to the province. That's what we've been doing. That's what we will continue to do, Mr. Speaker. And I would hope that the member opposite would be part Thank of you. that endeavour. Final supplementary. Um, you know, I... Uh, Talk about one individual's name's Dan Bailey. Uh, I think Ted, you've known Dan uh, your entire life. Uh, Dan being in his uh, early 50s, and he lost his job at A.O. Smith. Part of the decline in the manufacturing sector that you call a myth. Uh, Ted himself, Mr. Arnott, Wellington, Wellington Hills. I apologize, Speaker, has uh, now for probably eight years been highlighting the trend downwards in manufacturing jobs. He's brought good ideas to the table. He fights for folks like Dan Bailey. Mr. Bailey, in his early 50s, is going to have a very difficult time getting back into the job market, provide for his family to pay off the mortgage. Premier, I'll ask you again, when you see this type of circumstance in Ontario, don't you think you're wrong to say the decline of manufacturing is a myth? And isn't your obligation to support the policies that the member has brought forward to actually create jobs, open this up for investment, and get Ontario back? Can you say that, please? Can you say that, please? Thank you. 
Premier. Speaker, well, the fact that nearly 32,000 manufacturing jobs have been recovered since the recessionary low, I think that's a good news story, Mr. Speaker. I think that's something that we should focus on. And on top of that, Mr. Speaker, I will just say there are members here today of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. They have come from all across the province, Mr. Speaker, and they. That'll do. Thank you. Premier. You know, the members of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture know that it is extremely important that in Ontario we understand the importance of agri ag the agri-food industry, Mr. That's Speaker, right. that we understand that manufacturing includes the agriculture community and includes the agri-food industry, Mr. Absolutely. Speaker, and that innovation in that community, along with in automotive, in natural resources, in agriculture, film, small business, all of that, Mr. Speaker, that Answer. is how we are going to thrive. That's why we've been able to regain 32,000 manufacturing jobs, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue on that path as Ontario grows. New no question. Later. Um, back to the, uh, the Premier, Speaker. Uh, I mentioned uh, the challenges that uh, somebody like uh, Mr. Bailey is going to face. Um, the 300,000 uh, jobs that used to be in the manufacturing sector have now left other jurisdictions like Tennessee, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Indiana. And sadly, um, well, the Premier was visiting, I think, Wellington County. Uh, she said the following in response to the loss of jobs at A.O. Smith. She says, we're trending in the right direction. Um, Premier, how can, um, when, when you look at the 350 jobs Attorney General from A.O. Smith, when we find that like Westcast in Wingham just laid off more people yesterday, when Stanpak in Smithville is Questions? Of conflict, sending jobs to Texas instead of Ontario because of our hydro rates. Don't you think it's time to take a different course to actually rein in spending, lower Thank tax, you. get hydro rates under control? This not the Premier. 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 Thank you. Premier. You know, we know that, glo that global competition for manufacturing. Member from Oxford, we come to order. That. We recognize that we have to take strong action in order to be competitive. The and member we've been from doing Stormont, that, come to order. Which is why 32,000 manufacturing jobs have been regained since the recession, Mr. Speaker. So it's extremely important. I understand that there is a painful reality that when a particular plant closes or a particular business loses, leaves, that those jobs are lost. That is a painful reality. I understand that, Mr. Speaker. But we have to focus as a government, and I would think everyone in this legislature has to focus on how do we make sure people have the right skills so that we can make sure that they get the jobs that are available, Mr. Speaker, because that's one of the things that manufacturers say to me is from we're, Bruce looking, Gray, for sound, come we're to order. looking for people who have a particular skill set. So our responsibility is to make sure we match the labour force with the labour market, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Sir. Those jobs will come to the province. We will have that investment, Mr. Speaker, but only if we are positive and Thank we you. put the conditions in place. And the member from Chatham, member from Chatham, come to order. Second. Supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. Now, I, I don't doubt that the Premier has um, empathy for Mr. Bailey and the 350 people who lost their job at A.O. Smith, those who lost their jobs at John Deere, at Caterpillar. But the challenge is, I don't think your government understands the cause of the problem, nor do I believe, Premier, that the Liberal government has an understanding of how to actually move us forward and restore hope to those who have lost hope in our province. Who are out of work today? You know, we've brought forward policies to lower taxes in this Minister province, Training College to actually get energy rates under control, to drain that swamp of red tape and regulation and runaround that is contrary to your finance minister's opinion, the most burdensome Question? in all of Canada. We put those ideas on the table, Premier. This should be an alarm bell for you to hit the brakes and go in the opposite direction. Instead of trying to be more like California, Thank why don't you. we give our policies a plan and restore hope Thank for those you. without jobs and policies? Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. The Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. And employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I have to say that when it comes to A.O. Smith, we're doing everything we can as the government to support those workers who are in a very precarious situation, and uh, and certainly both through the Ministry of, Tra of uh, Training, Colleges, and Universities, uh, working with uh, all partners, the unions, the uh, the company involved, uh, the local mayor, and the other leadership, including the uh, the member representing Wellington. So we're working hard to do that. I've I talked with the mayor last week as well. We've offered to make available to those communities that. 
our Communities in Transition Fund, our Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, which, of course, uh, the, uh, the member opposite, the, op the official opposition, opposed its creation. So uh, that, it's an issue that we're taking very seriously. We know those are jobs that are going to be lost in the coming months, so we're working hard to make sure that they, those workers can transition into other opportunities. But when it comes to the manufacturing uh, sector, and if in uh, the supplementary I have an opportunity to speak to that, I enjoy you. that opportunity. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. No, I, I don't doubt that the, the minister is attempting to respond. Um, he's called the mayor. I just wish you had taken action in the nine years before this plan closed down. You know, the, the member for Wellington, Halton Hills, rang those alarm bells eight years ago. We brought forward ideas to grow the economy, to create jobs. I, I believe that manufacturing sector can make a comeback in Ontario. Minister of Transportation, like come to order. Industry. I believe our better days are yet to come. But let me ask you this. If you've embarked on policies for nine years that ramped up government spending, that plunged us towards doubling our debt, you're contemplating raising taxes again. Don't you understand that's going to cost us more jobs? That's going to dig the hole deeper. It's time to go down a bold new course. Question. Look at our plan. We'll turn the province around and we'll bring good manufacturing jobs. Okay. Please. Minister. Agree. Our, our manufacturing center in this uh, sector in this province is making a comeback, and it's yeah. making a comeback partly yeah. because this party and this government supported the auto sector at the time when the official opposition didn't. And let me also say, in terms of manufacturing sales in February, the member opposite, the leader of the official opposition, might be interested to know that manufacturing sales rose in eight provinces in, in February, led by this province, led by Ontario, in foreign, in foreign direct investment. This, this jurisdiction here in Ontario is the third best jurisdiction in all of North America for foreign direct investment. And let me give you an example that, in fact, the speaker might be familiar with. Just last Friday, an announcement was made in, made in, in Brantford, where a company called Hematite, which supports the auto sector, received $1.5 million from the Southwest Ontario Development Fund. And the president of that company, they're Answer. adding another line. They're going to be uh, creating, uh, they're doubling employment in the next two years. The president of that company, John Pagnell, said, without the Southwest Thank Ontario you. Development Fund, Thank you. New question, the member from Bramley, Gore Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. New Democrats have been clear since the throne speech that if we're going to support a budget, it has to create jobs, it has to strengthen our health care, and it has to make life more affordable. When families sit down to pay their bills, one of the biggest ones is their auto insurance bill. This government has brought in changes to help make the industry more profitable, but has told drivers time and time again that there's nothing more they can do for them. Is the government finally prepared to take some real action to make drivers in this province have a more affordable insurance premium? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have said that this is an area of great concern to us, that, uh, that auto insurance premiums in Ontario are too high, that we need, to, uh, we need to work to make sure that they are lowered, as we have been doing, quite frankly, since 2004, Mr. Speaker. We made a lot of changes. Uh, auto insurance rates did go down, Mr. Speaker, on average, I think, 11 per cent across the, the province. Uh, we recognize that they have risen again, and we are, we are committed to uh, working to reduce those, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, here's a frustration for people in my community and for millions of Ontarians in this province. They're paying the highest premiums in Canada. They've seen the government bring in reforms that have put billions of dollars into the pockets of the industry, but their rates keep climbing. Will the government give the Financial Services Commission of Ontario the mandates and the tools to actually bring about a reduction in auto insurance rates by 15 per cent. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I'm just going to contextualize this because there are a number of issues that have been raised by the, the third party. Auto insurance is one of them, home care is one of them, youth employment is another one, Mr. Speaker. And I have said quite clearly that these are all areas that we are interested in and have been interested in working on, Mr. Speaker. They are things that I think absolutely need to be addressed. 
And we are going to do that in a responsible way, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to do it in a way that is practical and doable, that in fact can be implemented. So I have had, uh, I've had a conversation with the leader of the third party, and I, I know that this is a concern, and I know that there's a particular approach that, uh, that the NDP would like to take. We have taken that into consideration, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to work to reduce auto insurance premiums in a way that is practical, that's doable, and that will ensure yes, that sir. people in, in the province will continue to be able to get auto insurance, Mr. Speaker, and uh, at a reduced rate. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, here's the problem. People in this province feel like they're simply falling behind, but we're determined to make sure they get results in this upcoming budget. For years, for years, the government has promised that tax cuts to Ontario's largest corporations would trickle down into jobs for Ontarians that handing out six-figure pay hikes to hospital CEOs would somehow make our patients healthier, and that Order. higher insurance industry profits would somehow— Excuse me. The third party has the floor. Please. Thank you. And that higher insurance industry profits would trickle down to drivers. People are tired of the status quo that's simply not working for people Question. here in Ontario. It hasn't worked, and it's time for some real results in this upcoming budget. The government has already supported a motion to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 percent. Will the government— Thank you. Premier. Finance. The luxury car lobby. Really Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, and, and to the member's question. And he knows all too well the efforts and the work that we've done as a government to try to combat the issues of fraud, recognizing that the root cause of this is the cost of our claims. The cost of the claims in Ontario are 10 times higher than any other province. We've taken the steps necessary to address those issues. We recognize and agree that premiums, as a result, are much too high. We also recognize and acknowledge that the companies did lose money in the previous years. We are doing what's necessary to uh, initiate the change. We're going to work with all parties to try to ensure that we get at this and that we reduce premiums for all Ontarians and the 9 million drivers that exist in this great province. We are going to do this. We're going to work with Fisco to get it done. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Ontarians expect that government will put them first, but instead this government seems intent on putting private power companies first, like those in Oakville and Mississauga. The Liberals gave a contract to one even though it was borrowing money at 60 per cent per annum. The Liberals told the Ontario Power Authority to abandon its legal defences when it came to settling with another. Why did the government put the interests of private power companies ahead of the interests of Ontarians? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I appreciate the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, it's hard to believe, but it was just last week that the Auditor General reported uh, on the Mississauga issue. And uh, at that time, the very next day, Mr. Speaker, uh, including members from the NDP and the Conservatives, asked the question about costs at Oakville. Why don't you just tell us now the cost of cancelling Oakville? Another one. Release all of the costs related to the Oakville. Do it now, Premier. The people of Ontario deserve nothing less. Another one. Why don't you just reveal the cost of the Oakville cancellation? Well, last week, Mr. Speaker, the government did ask the Ontario Power Authority to come to committee with their most up-to-date costs on Oakville. Answer. Mr. Speaker, we did move a motion. The government moved a motion yesterday to have the OPA here today. Thank and you. both opposition parties Thank voted you. against it. Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, back to you. Two former energy ministers testified they had no idea that their staff were destroying information. Wow. But the former chief of staff to those two ministers told us he was destroying information. Wow. Can the Premier tell us whether she can provide any assurance that her staff and the staff of all ministers are acting within the law when it comes to preserving information? Minister of Energy. Refer to the uh, government house leader. Government house leader. 
Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the committee uh, is looking Member from into Bruce Green, uh, on sound. a whole from variety order. of issues re related to the gas plants and in terms of the production of documents, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the government has uh, worked in good faith to comply with the committee's That's rulings to the happened. point where, uh, with the encouragement of the Premier, our members last fall moved forward with a motion to have all government ministries in a very wide sweep produce the uh, uh, all documents related to the gas plants issue to the committee. And that member, joined by his opposition well, colleagues, no, voted against that, Mr. Speaker. There is a process in place whereby uh, committees can ask for documents. They didn't want to go the route that we suggested, well, no. and we are working to comply with uh, any requests that come forward, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you. Final supplementary. Member from Leeds, Grenville, come to order. Kind of hard to provide documents that have been destroyed, Speaker. Kind of hard. Chris Bentley, the former Minister of Energy, yesterday claimed the reason the government's bogus cost number was different from that of the Auditor General was because the ministry used a different way of counting costs. The Auditor General used standard accounting when he determined the cost of the Mississauga cancellation. Premier won't say whether she still believes the $40 million figure for the Oakville cancellation is the one that, in fact, is true. Will the Premier tell us whether the $40 million figure for Oakville was regular accounting or liberal accounting? <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, the honourable member has the gall to ask that question, and yesterday, at the urging of the Minister of Energy and the support of government members, we asked for a special session to bring the OPA forward where they could answer right. a whole range of questions on this know. issue. That member voted against it. And Mr. Speaker, in terms of the production of documents, let me share a quote. Let me share a quote from the member from Nipissing, what he had to tell the committee yesterday. Listen to this. Quote, you know the Premier reminds us every day that documents will continue to be turned over, and this is a reasonable request of timing of two weeks. We ask for that day after day after day. We've been asking that and listen to this and have been wonderfully receiving these documents. Mr. Speaker, we have been working in good faith to meet the committee's requirements. We have gone beyond it in terms of transparency. And Mr. Speaker, the opposition Answer. reach a good tune here, but they constantly put their hands up to vote against our motions. Thank you. Your question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, you've admitted the gas plant cancellations were political decisions, but at the Justice Committee, your former Energy Minister, twice removed, swore that it was because that power was no longer required. He also told the Toronto Star, quote, it won't be built anywhere in Ontario, quote. Premier, we finally uncovered documents that tell us what really happened. This is from your Justice Ministry, quote, the government offered to make TransCanada whole by finding another gas plant from which it could make profits, and in return, TransCanada promised not to sue or otherwise embarrass the government. Rude. Now, Speaker, we're finally getting to the truth of why this new gas plant is being built. Premier, did you spend all that taxpayer money just to save Liberal embarrassment? Mr. Speaker, again, it's astonishing that they stand here and they ask questions for information, then they vote against. They vote against the government motion to have the OPA come before the committee. Mr. Speaker, last night the Premier showed up in this legislature to participate in the late show with the honourable member. He chose not to participate. Mr. Speaker, Tuesday morning, the government members have asked that the leader of the opposition That was good. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, government members requested the Leader of the Opposition to come before the committee. And you know what the opposition did, Mr. Speaker? They attempted that. The official opposition attempted to block that motion. So perhaps in the supplementary, the honourable member will tell us. Stop. The, um, uh, the member from uh, Simcoe Gray, I'm trying to get somebody else on the other side. Just give me a chance. Minister of Rural Affairs come to order, and especially when he's answering. Finish. 
Perhaps, Mr. Speaker, he will tell us, is the Leader of the Opposition going to play calendar on Tuesday, or will he be there to answer our Thank questions? Well, Speaker, if I wanted to see dancing like that, next time I'll buy a ticket to a chorus line. <clears throat> Premier, as if your political motivations weren't enough, let's look at how the plant we didn't need was cited. Under sworn testimony, the former Premier's Chief of Staff told the Justice Committee that it was he who came up with the five replacement site options. His number one choice was in Napanee, hundreds of kilometres from Oakville. I asked him what experience he had in citing energy plants, and he said none. He has no energy experience whatsoever. Premier, given that liberal logic, why didn't you just throw darts at a dartboard? You might have gotten a little closer to Oakville and saved the taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars. Question. I, I asked the Premier again, did you spend all of that taxpayer money just to save liberal embarrassment? I have the Mr. Speaker, let's talk about political motivation. We've had tweets, we've had YouTube. I have here a Conservative Party pamphlet. The member, the, the Minister of Rural, uh, Rural Affairs, will not uh, put that up in the air again. If he does, uh, he'll be uh, admonished. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I have here a Conservative Party pamphlet. You can tell it's a Conservative Party pamphlet because the Leader of the Opposition is nowhere to be seen on it, Mr. Speaker, as is usually the case. But let me quote it, Mr. Speaker. The only party that will stop the Sherway Power Plant is the Ontario PC Party. On October 6, vote Ontario PC. Elect Mary Ann DeMont, whale and authorized by the CFO for the Etobicoke Centre Progressive Conservative Riding Association, and he has the gall to talk about political political overtones, Mr. Speaker. The Progressive Conservative Party was 100% against. New question, the member from Nickelback. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Which head health in other hospitals that was affected by the diluted chemotherapy drugs? Lake Ridge had no idea that there was a grey area in regulation, and had they known, the process for securing those drugs would have been completely different. The hospital it's take, is taking its responsibility and doing everything it can to close the gaps in oversight. My question is, will the minister be as forthright and admit that she failed both hospital and patients by failing to provide the necessary oversight? Minister of Health and Long -term Care. Speaker, what I can tell you is that when I became aware of the situation, I took immediate and swift action. Speaker, the first thing that my the first concern, of course, was for the patients affected, and I want to commend our hospitals for a, a very quickly identifying the affected patients, for reaching out to them, for facilitating appointments with their oncologists, and providing them with uh, uh, with answers to their personal questions. Speaker, I then established a working group of all of the affected uh, partners in this. Speaker. I've appointed Dr. Jake Thiessen to lead um, an investigation of the cancer drug supply chain. I've uh, posted regulations, Speaker, directing hospitals to purchase only from suppliers who are accredited. Uh, the College of Pharmacists is, uh, is developing a regulation to give them access that they need to these facilities, Speaker. I'm very yes, pleased that uh, Health Canada is now uh, taking ownership, Speaker, as well. They are moving on this issue. They, they know this requires a national solution. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess the question is there. When she became aware, why did it take so long to become aware? The gray area was first identified in 1997. This is 15 years ago. Since 2009, a policy document outlining a decision-making process between the two levels of government has been in place. Today, we are learning that the problem does not exist in isolation but it extends to some of the biggest players in the healthcare system. Speaker, will the minister finally stop dodging responsibility and commit to doing her job and close this gap in oversight? Thank you.
Speaker, I have done exactly that, and the member opposite knows that I have done exactly that. Speaker, it is clear this is a national problem. It requires a national solution. Even the federal minister acknowledges that this requires a national solution. Baxter is a company that supplies drugs to Ontario hospitals. It also supplies uh, uh, to hospitals right across the province. We are doing our part. We are expanding the mandate of the College of Pharmacists. We are instructing hospitals to take this responsibility seriously. Speaker, it's very important that if the member opposite has suggestions on what more we need to do, I would be most interested in hearing that. I can assure the House that when I became Answer. aware of this, I acted immediately. I took the appropriate steps. If there's more that the member opposite thinks I need to do, I want to hear Thank from you. her. Thank you. The member from Mississauga, Brent Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is blessed to have a beautiful north rich with natural resources. It is important to preserve the natural beauty of North, but at the same time, it's also important to promote and ensure sustainable development of natural resources. The process of such development must take into consideration the interest and aspirations of all stakeholders and for the benefit of all Ontarians, Minister, will you inform this House the modernizing of Mining Act? How will it help for the sustainable development of natural resources? Thank you. Hey, Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Mississauga, Brampton South, for that great question. Uh, certainly, we want to acknowledge that the process of the Modernize the Mining Act, a very important piece of legislation, and now the supporting uh, regulations are, are, are part of a very extensive consultation process. Certainly between a two-year period between January 2010 and 2012, we held over 70 discussions, consultation sessions with Aboriginal groups and communities, industry stakeholders, uh, environmental organizations, and a, and a series of municipal representatives. One of our key stakeholders, uh, Speaker, is the Ontario Mining Association. I want to share a quote from Chris Hodson, uh, the president of the OMA, who members here will know was previously a minister of Northern Development and Mines in the mid-90s. Here's their quote. Uh, the Ontario Mining Association appreciates the consultative and focused approach Answer. to the development of the new Mining Act regulations. Ontario competes with other jurisdictions for mining investment, and a clearly defined regulatory environment Thank is you. critical to ensuring the province continues as a Thank mining you. speaker. Minister, it's great to hear that you have done commendable work to ensure meaningful changes to the Mining Act so that Ontario remains one of the best places in the world for mining exploration and mining investment. Can the Minister share with this House how modernizing of the Mining Act will impact stakeholders, northern communities? and economic growth. Uh, great question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, uh, thank you again, the member, for the question. Uh one of our goals of the Modernized Mining Act, Speaker, is to provide certainty and clarity uh, and encourage uh, early engagement, obviously, and ongoing relationship building with Aboriginal communities. Uh, speaker, we've instituted a permanent uh, focus flow-through tax credit of 5 per cent to encourage investment in mineral exploration, significant tax benefits for uh, new or expanding mines, particularly for new mines in remote areas, extended the Northern Industrial Energy Rate Program, a huge uh, program subject, to, of course, to annual program funding approval, which supports Northern Ontario's largest industrial consumers in reducing energy costs, sustaining employment, and maintaining the sector's global competitive speaker. We continue to invest in services and such as geological mapping and the digitization of geoscience information to help Ontario's mineral exploration sector yes, identify areas of economic opportunity, a hugely important piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker, and we're grateful for all the support. Thank you. 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 Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Premier, yesterday we reached a new low in the growing gas plant scandal. In an embarrassing spectacle at the Justice Committee, two former energy ministers played dumb rather than providing answers. Throw in, the third, throw in the current minister, and the theme song for this debacle is Three Blind Mice. Premier, I'm worried. 
Now that performances like yesterday undermine your credibility, not that there's much left. What worries me is investors seeing this cast of characters this scandal has produced and questioning if Ontario is really a place to do business. Isn't it time to stop playing this dangerous game with Ontario's future by finally showing some leadership and providing the real cost to cancel the Oakville plant? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Uh, Premier, just a moment, please. Um, I'm going to mention this. I'm not particularly impressed with the, the tone uh, used, although it did not use unparliamentary language. Uh, it is not the race to the top that I've been requesting. So I would ask all questioners and people giving the answer that you consider that, please, uh, to keep this place in good decorum. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the government house leader will want to speak to the events at, uh, at committee, but I, I, I really think that at this moment in our history in the province that it's very important that all parties work together, Mr. Speaker. We're here in a minority parliament, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the leader of the opposition has said that uh, his party is opposed to the budget before having read it, Mr. Speaker, and I don't understand that way of, uh, of uh, doing politics, but that's what's been said. I don't think that we should, as a parliament, be intent on an unnecessary election, Mr. Speaker. I think that we should be trying to work together, uh, and I would invite I would invite the member opposite to work with us. I would invite the party opposite to work with us, Mr. Speaker. I think that's what the people of Answer. Ontario are looking for as we go into this budget. I would at least ask that the party opposite read the budget before they vote against it, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Premier, here's how bad it is. The only one that seems to be making sense over there is the member for Mississauga Streetsville, and last week people called him a space cadet. <laughs> Withdrawn. Withdrawn. <laughs> you know, I think he's finally come down from the clouds, and I'm actually going to quote him. It's a quote from the Toronto Star. The member from Mississauga Streetsville said, it's our responsibility as a government if we've got something new to add, that we add it as soon as we know it." Unquote. Premier, you know the true cost of the Oakville plant now. You just want to bring the OPA boss in to be your fall guy again. Well, the buck stops with you, Premier, yep. not a bureaucrat. Yep. Will you take Mr. Delaney's advice and do something responsible and tell us the cost of the Oakville plant last year? This is absolutely outrageous. The government went forward yesterday. You want to talk about yesterday at committee? We went forward with a motion to have a special meeting where the OPA could come in and answer all the questions the opposition had. They voted against it, Mr. Speaker. We asked the Leader of the Opposition to come on Tuesday morning. They attempted to block it, Mr. Speaker, through a motion that we put forward. Mr. Speaker, the Premier, the Premier came to this chamber last night for two late shows, and two of their members chose not to participate in them. Mr. Speaker, if anyone has an apology about what happened yesterday related to the gas plant file. It's the members of that party over there. Thank you. Your question, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, last year, Hamilton fell in love with Nicole Casavitas. This 14-year-old young woman and her family battled numerous hardships while Nicole awaited a heart transplant. Tragically, two weeks after the transplant, Nicole died. Today is the first anniversary of Nicole's death. Her family is here today speaking publicly about their year-long battle to get answers surrounding her treatment and passing at Sick Kids Hospital. Speaker, why does this family have to go through such great lengths to get answers in our health care system? How can the minister help them today to get the answers they need? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite, and I would like to uh, welcome family members here. Uh, this is a, a, a case that I am not familiar with. Uh, it would have been preferable had the, minister, had the member notified me of this case so I could have more information for the family. I would be more than happy to meet with the family after question period to understand what questions they have. Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> Speaker. Nicole's family continues to be haunted by questions regarding her care. They have quietly worked through all the proper channels over the past year, but they still are without answers. The buck needs to stop here, Minister. The existing oversight in our health care system is clearly failing Ontarians. 
for families like the Casavides having an independent third party to answer their questions and help guide them through would make a world of difference to them and many Ontarians. Speaker, will this minister listen to the families like Nicole's and commit to ombudsman oversight of our hospitals today? Uh, speaker, uh, as I said uh, in the first question, I will be more than happy to meet with the family uh, after question period, and I can learn more about this situation and uh, um, make sure that you get answers that you deserve. Thank you. New question? The member from Ottawa Orleans. Thank you, Speaker. This question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, Ontario's small and rural hospitals are an integral part of the communities they serve. Not only are these hospitals vital for providing care in a timely, efficient fashion, many Ontarians rely on their local hospitals to provide a wide variety of services. But there's no doubt people living in rural communities face some unique challenges. Ensuring our small and rural hospitals continue to provide excellent care for all Ontarians is of critical importance. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, could the Minister please update the House on what our government is doing to strengthen our rural hospitals? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. Care. And uh, I, I thank the member uh, from Ottawa Orleans for uh, for his passionate advocacy on this issue. I can assure you that we are committed to those small and rural hospitals that are so important in their communities. Speaker, I was recently in Seaforth where I was able to announce some of the uh, projects that were being funded by a special $20 million fund for small and rural hospitals. I was uh, very impressed by the innovation, by the transformation that is underway in our small and rural. The member from uh, Huron Bruce come to order and the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound is warned. Carry on. I, I was uh, extremely impressed by the innovation that uh, was being demonstrated by these uh, projects that will strengthen uh, access to care in small and rural communities. Speaker, we are determined to, uh, to provide all Ontarians, no matter where they live, with uh, access to the right care, the right time, the right place. Speaker, uh, I was very pleased that four of the 23 new hospitals are in rural Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. I'm glad to hear the new Ontario government takes the need of small and rural hospitals seriously. Improving and moder modernizing these hospitals is critical to ensuring they remain effective, efficient, and access accessible to the communities they serve. Providing access to the right care at the right time in the right place supports Ontario's action plan for health care. It is part of the new Ontario government's effort to build a strong economy and a fair society for the benefit of all. I recently heard some good news about rural hospitals funding in southwestern Ontario. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what are some specific examples of efforts our government has undertaken to strengthen and improve small and rural hospitals Question. in this part of the province? Thank you, Minister. Um, uh, the Minister of Rural Affairs. Huh? Minister of Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for his question. Um, of course, we know that rural communities have unique health care. So that's why we're making important investments. Just this last went, uh, Monday, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Wigham, uh, the, east coast, the west coast of Ontario, and Mount Forest, and I experienced the warm hospitality from the member from Huron Bruce and the member from Perth Wellington. Our government is supporting renovations and improvements at the Wigham at District Hospital and in the Waterloo Lynn. I was very pleased to join with the members and Mr. Speaker. I had a great lunch at Wigham at Grumpy's Cafe, and all the talk there that day was about the new Chinese investment for two casting plants in Wigham, Ontario. It was a good news day to be in Wigham, Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to make strategic investments in rural Ontario. That's what our new government is all about, and that's what we're doing each and every day. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Speaker, my uh, questions to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday, while the Premier was busy buying off the NDP, or as they're now known, the Liberal Farm Team, the Justice. No. For, stop the call. First of all, sometimes it is hard to hear on parliamentary language because of all the chatter, and second of all, I got it. <laughs> The member will withdraw. Withdrawn. Your question, please. This committee heard from the former energy minister Duguid and Bentley. 
Given the continued evasion and selective amnesia of Liberal witnesses, it's not surprising that both of them denied having any knowledge of a $712 million offer to TransCanada. Speaker, we can accept that Minister Duguid may not have known since Premier McGuinty chose to cut him out, not trusting him with his file. What we can't accept, though, is that the Premier and the Energy Minister are as clueless as Minister Duguid. The TransCanada negotiations went to Cabinet. We know that. We also know that Premier Rennie was chair of Cabinet. The Premier knows what it costs to cancel Oakville plant. So why doesn't she just come clean right here, right now? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's, just, it's, 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 it's beyond incredible. <coughs> Government members yesterday went forward and put forward a plan, Mr. Speaker, where the OPA would appear in front of the committee to answer all the questions as technical as, as any member wanted to go through the entire process by know. which uh, these various uh, plants were dealt with. They voted no. Mr. Speaker, they're the demanding picture. answers from the Premier. She shows up for a late show last Remember night. From they Simple don't Gray participate. North, Mr. Speaker, we have some questions on this side of the House about the costing that the PC party had when they put out pamphlets like oh. the one that I quoted from earlier. And yet, Mr. Speaker, when we attempted to call the Leader of the Opposition, they tried to block it. So perhaps in the supplementary, oh, like he will right. confirm to this Legislature whether the Leader of the Opposition will appear next Tuesday at 8.30 a.m. to answer our questions. Thank you. Supplementary. There. Speaker, back to the Premier. You know, Speaker, it must be difficult for the Liberal members to watch the Premier's credibility evaporate each and every passing day. And while the Liberal apologists and the NDP are willing to excuse any scandal, no matter how large or how egregious, as long as they get bought off, we in the PC caucus are determined to get in. No, I, I got to point it out before you do. The member will withdraw. Withdrawn. So, you know, Speaker, the gas plant scandal is knocking on the Premier's door. She was the chair of Cabinet. Her name is on the documents. She was briefed on, quote, buckets of costs. The Premier should save Minister Shirelli the run down the hallway, save him the aggravation. Will she come save clean and reveal the costs of the Oakville cancellation right here, right now? Mr. Speaker, uh, you want to talk about knocking on someone's door? Let's talk about the leader of the opposition, who made a YouTube video, Mr. Speaker, a YouTube video where he stood there with his adoring PC candidates in a crowd of five or six onlookers and said, if he was elected, it would be done, done, done. Mr. Speaker, it was his candidate, his candidate, Mary Ann DeMont Whalen, who put out this pamphlet saying, the only party that will underline, Mr. Speaker, will stop the Sherway power plant is the Ontario PC party. Oh. Mr. Speaker, again, why did, are all the honourable members over there failing to answer my very simple question? Next Tuesday morning, 8.30 a.m., will the Leader of the Opposition be there to answer questions? Answer. Because later in the day, Mr. Speaker, the Premier will be there to answer questions. We'd like the OPA to come forward, but they keep blocking it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Kenora, Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. It has been almost a year since the federal government decided to shut down the Experimental Lakes area, a world-renowned site. After much pressure from within Canada and across the globe, the Ontario government announced today that it has finally seen the light. It has finally seen the light. It's only taken a year. They finally realized and recognized the importance of keeping the ELA operational, but your announcement didn't provide any details at all as to what funding it will put in place and what exactly you're willing to do to save the experiment. Listen, the environment come to order. Our question is straightforward. Is the deal final, and what commitment has your government made to ensure that this important site remains open? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I am so pleased that the member opposite has asked this question. I think it is just fantastic. And I know, I know that she cares about this issue, Mr. Speaker, and it was about a year ago that I was in Kenora, and I met with uh, Mayor Canfield. He was driving me around. We were talking about bridges and roads, and he talked to me about the Experimental Lakes area. I was very concerned, Mr. Speaker, because there was a question about whether it was going to survive. It is a federal project, as the member opposite knows. And so, Mr. Speaker, I am thrilled that we are stepping up to the plate, that we are going to work with the government of Manitoba, with the federal government, with the Institute for 
for sustainable development, and we are going to come to an arrangement, Mr. Speaker, where this terrific and unique science endeavor will be able to go forward, it's Mr. Speaker. Budget, so we know that the operating it. costs are it's up to $2 million. Forward. We have said that Thank we are going you, to support Sarah. this. There are some details to be worked out, Mr. Speaker, in terms of capital costs. That's what the negotiation is about. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to take the opportunity to thank everyone in my riding and across Canada who stepped up and fought hard to keep the experimental lakes open. It was through their petitions, their town halls, their state statements, debates in this House and press conferences across the world that this, that this government's finally seen the light. This site is not about politics. It's about groundbreaking research, and people are looking Um, we're getting there. Just settle down, and I would ask the Minister of the Environment to take a bit of a break. Excuse. Thank you. As I said, this site is not about politics. It's about groundbreaking research, and people are looking to this provincial government for a real plan. This government is not providing the basic answers to some of the most important questions around the ELA. People are desperate to know who will pay the operating costs, who will cover the liability, and what steps have been taken to ensure this site will remain open permanently. Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I think it's a great day in Ontario when you see levels of government coming together to recognize the importance of the Experimental Lakes area in Ontario, which is a gem and which many scientists have come all around the world to study important issues climate change, the impact of pollution on our water. A whole variety of important scientific uh, experiments have taken place there for so many years. What our Premier said today, Speaker, is that we would work with our partners, our partners such as IASD, the federal government, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the ministries in, in Manitoba that all have a role to play. And I think what you're seeing is a collaborative approach of coming together to Sir. say we all have a stake in this important investment that has been there for so many years. There's ongoing discussions right now. We look Thank forward you. to work with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to Thank make you. this a reality. The member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for seniors. Every day, many seniors in my riding of Scarborough Ridge River consider moving into a retirement home as they enter a new chapter in their life. Seniors want a place where they feel comfortable and accepted. They want a place where they are cared for and treated with respect, and their families want to ensure their safety. It is important that residents feel safe and are protected in their new accommodations. With the concerns of seniors and their families in mind, can the minister please tell us what our government has done to protect those who decide to live in a retirement home in Ontario? Thank you. Minister responsible for seniors. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My thanks to the member from Scarborough Ridge River. It is indeed a very good question. It reflects the genuine concern of the member uh, himself mine and that of the government as well, Speaker. For many seniors, a retirement home is a place where they may be spending the rest of their best years, Speaker. Therefore, in 2010, our government took action and passed the Retirement Home Act, the first such legislation in Ontario. The Act sets very clear guidelines and levels of care that our seniors should be receiving and entitled to receive in a living, uh, living uh, uh, retirement home living speaker. The Act speaker provides safety, comfort and peace of mind, not only for the residents themselves, but for the family members. And we will Answer. continue to see that indeed they will receive such a care speaker. And I thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> speaker, this is great news for our seniors. Speaker, many of our seniors are not fully aware of how the Retirement Homes Act offers protection or benefits to them. At times, many seniors and families are concerned about the potential of safety issues, but I know our government has taken strong action to keep seniors safe in Ontario. 
It is important, Speaker, that seniors are provided with the information on how the Retirement Homes Act protect their rights, safety, and standard of living. Speaker, can the minister now tell us, and all seniors across Ontario, how this act will be enforced and also what are the benefits to them? Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, to you, to the member, and to all our seniors in our province, let me say that the uh, Retirement Home Act <coughs> legislate strong uh, protection for seniors and created the uh, Retirement Home Regulatory Authority, an independent body that conducts its own random investigations, inspections, oversees compliance and enforcement, mandates the level of care and safety standards, emergency plans, training for staff, and much more, Speaker. For the first time in Ontario, there is a public registry for retirement homes, and as of July 1, 2012, Speaker, all retirement homes, in order to continue to operate in Ontario, must indeed apply for a license. And These sir? are positive changes, Speaker, and are helping seniors live in a safe, secure environment and continue to enjoy years of fulfillment and meaningful life, Speaker. Thank you. First in the member from York Simple. My question is to the Premier. Last Monday, the Auditor General reported that the Ontario Power Authority paid Greenfield $41 million in labour costs that Greenfield had incurred between 2004 and 2012. However, the Auditor General also tells us this amount was paid with no supporting documentation, wow. no copies of payroll, no T4s, no other information. My question for the Premier is, is it not common practice to require this kind of documentation, or can any company provide blanked-out charges on invoices and receive money from the government to pay a Mr. Speaker, no. again, the, uh, the opposition is asking well, for uh, detailed answers to a variety of issues uh, related to the gas plant, and yesterday government members went forward with a motion asking that the OPA come forward for a special session where they'd be able to cast light, I'm sure, on many of the issues that have been I'd raised like to today. And you know what happened, Mr. Speaker? They voted against it, Mr. Speaker. Right. Mr. Speaker, last night the Premier came to this chamber to participate in a late show, and two of the members that have called for it over there chose not to participate. Mr. Speaker, you can't have it both ways. You can't come here every day and ask detailed questions, and then when the government tries to provide those opportunities, we go before the committee and offer a government-wide search of documents, and Mr. Speaker, that member's party votes against it. They can't have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And um, back to the Premier, I, I hope you'll be able to answer uh, for me on this question. This past Monday, a week after the Auditor General released his report on the cost of the power plant, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing responded to a question regarding reimbursement costs in Thunder Bay, and she said, and I quote, I plan to be in Thunder Bay later this week to talk with the mayors and councillors to make sure that we have the receipts we need, because at the end of the day, we have an Auditor General we're responsible to. Got it right. We have to provide the paperwork, but we want to be there to help that community. End of quote. Why does Question. the Liberal government need receipts to help flood victims, but not the relocation of poverty? Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General was a witness before the committee last week and had a chance to address many of these issues. And we offered to go farther, Mr. Speaker, by having the Ontario Power Authority come forward for a special session today. And, Mr. Speaker, first the opposition voted against it. Then they attempted, Mr. Speaker, to block our efforts to have the Leader of the Opposition come before the committee. We're going to have the Premier there next Tuesday, Mr. Speaker. She's committed to it. But what we want to know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, is, is the Leader of the Opposition going to play calendar? And he's too busy to come forward to talk about his strong support for the cancellation.
cancellation of the gas plants and why in the last I'm election he so strongly promised it, Mr. Speaker, to talk about his uh, analysis that was done, his costing was done. Mr. Speaker, I am waiting for a member of the opposition to stand up and confirm that he will be there, Mr. Speaker, to explain why he went forward with such a strong support for the cancellation. Good question. The member from Timmins-James Bay. To the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Minister, along with my colleague, the member for Tabiskaming, we met about a month ago to talk about the state of the highways in northern Ontario and about how the winter road maintenance that is going on right now is, quite frankly, substandard, full of highway closures. I'm going to have a page come over here and send, show you the picture that was taken yesterday on Highway 11 outside of Hearst. The road there was closed, Minister, when there should have never been a closure. It's not as if it never snowed in northern Ontario. What's wrong is the standard to which those contractors are being held to maintain the highways are lesser than they were when the Ministry of Transportation used to do them. You said you were going to look into this matter. Why are highways still being closed on moderate snowstorms in northern Ontario? Thank you. For transportation and infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm quite happy to answer. I want to thank the member for the question, and I also want to thank both him and his colleague for working with us on this issue. As the member knows, the standards have not changed. And, and well, from no, no, I, I, I appreciate the concern, and, and I want to say, Mr. Speaker, I do believe this is a very sincere concern, one that I share. We are looking at ways, and I've taken the advice of the members opposite, on how we can improve those standards. We are working very closely on that right now. We are reviewing that with the regions. I will be up uh, uh, actually tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, meeting with mayors uh, in, in northwestern Ontario to talk about this very issue. Um, and I will continue in my supplementary to give a more full answer, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, supplementary. Well, Minister, clearly this is showing that your privatization initiative isn't working. You're trying to get contracts to maintain a highway to a lesser standard than we used to ourselves when we used to maintain those highways. It's not as if, as I said earlier, it doesn't snow in northern Ontario. It's been snowing for centuries in northern Ontario, and the difference is we used to be able to get the highways plowed. So I'm going to ask you again, will you reverse the decision of your government to privatize or, at the very least, increase the standards in those contracts so we can drive on those highways and not see closures like we did yesterday? Thank you. Minister. M Mr. Speaker, the, this is a continuing conversation I've had with mayors who have said that their own snow removal this year was particularly problematic because the nature mix of precipitation and the challenges that they had. This wasn't uniquely to the Ontario uh, situation. Uh, there are different weather patterns and there are different challenges. So very seriously. So th that is part of it. I've also said to you, and I'm very seriously, that I think we can do a better job there. And you've given this government some suggestions, which we are taking very seriously. I will look into this particular matter, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member Answer. for it. Uh, I am again taking that this review very seriously. I will be back in Northern Ontario literally tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with the member opposite. I, the, I appreciate uh, the Mr. Gray on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. I want to welcome to the uh, legislature today, uh, Mr. Keith Curry, a director of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I rise on a point of order. While I intended to be at the late show last night, I was sadly at the side show. Uh, the that's, that's enough. That's uh, not a point of order. And. Uh, You know, just because question period is over doesn't mean that I don't lose authority. Thank you. The member from Newmarket Aurora on a point of order. Yes, Speaker, on a point of order. I want to extend my apologies to the Premier uh, for not being here last night. There was an error in my scheduling. I'm willing to reschedule that for tomorrow evening if the if Premier is willing. That's, that's another way to do it. Minister of Finance on a Point of yes, point of order, Mr. Speaker. I would like to take this opportunity to make a formal announcement to the House that I will be tabling the 2013 budget on Thursday, May 2nd at 4 p.m. That is a point of order. 
And before we do uh, recess, I do have a comment to make, and I would really appreciate no comments. Um, I'm going to say this as a some, somewhat sorry and uh, frustrating, and at times uh, sad, that members are taking to personal insults or commenting on individuals. I'm going to ask and challenge us that this does not help this place, our reputation and what we stand for. I'm going to ask you, as honourable members, which I treat all of you as, to avoid the personal comments, the insults, or the comments about anyone's attendance. Uh, I think we can do better, and I'm asking us all to do that. This House, uh, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.